Uh, good morning, welcome back everybody. So um, yesterday I, I finished the lecture with some elementary comparisons between spherical excesses in different points. Um, you have noticed that the epsilon regularity theorems are actually stated in terms of something which have to do with a cylinder rather than a sphere, right? So um, this is for a graph more natural. And so let me actually introduce the cylindrical excess. So in, 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 in what follows, we will use the following notation for a cylinder CRP of the following form, or let's say for a cylinder CRX of the following form. So we have a disk in Rm of radius R and centered at X, and then we multiply by R to the power N over here. So this is a subset of Rm. Okay, and then we have seen uh, uh, the formula that if we take the m-dimensional volume of the graph of a function u over this disk of radius r and centered at x, and if we subtract the n-dimensional volume of the base, then we find that actually this one is equal to the integral, so to one-half the integral over the graph of u intersected the cylinder of the distance between the tangent, the tangent space or the m vector orienting the tangent space at any point p to the graph of u minus the m vector orienting the base space to the power 2. And this is in the Hausdorff measure in the point p. OK? So it looks natural, actually, to introduce that for this notion over here as a notion of cylindrical excess. And as we have done for the um, uh, case of the sphere, we actually introduce a notion of cylindrical excess for a general vector, m vector pi, so for a general plane pi. And this is going to be 1 half the integral over the cylinder of the distance between the tangent space to the graph of u and your m vector pi squared. Okay? And contrary to what we do with the sphere, if we uh, omit pi, then we understand that the excess is actually computed with respect to the uh, horizontal plane. So with the sphere, we were actually minimizing because we don't have any uh, preferred choice. In the case of the cylinder, we are just using the horizontal plane. Notice also that this excess is not normalized, right? So for the sphere, we were dividing by omega m and then r to the power m. So here we are not dividing, what is most important is that we are not dividing by r to the power m. So if we were dividing by r to the power m, then this would be more similar to the spherical excess. So of course there is an obvious comparison. Um, if I take the m plus n dimensional ball of radius r centered at x u of x, this is contained in the cylinder. So it is therefore obvious that modulo the normalization constant, I can actually compare the excess with respect to a certain plane pi in the ball to the excess with respect to a certain plane, to the same plane pi in the cylinder, simply because I'm actually integrating on a larger set, right? So of course then this inequality is just obvious. And then here I would have just the same thing. Okay, it's, it's less obvious that I can actually have a reverse inequality. So while of course I am 
with the sphere of radius r inside the cylinder of radius r. If I am taking the sphere of radius r, I'm missing actually something from the cylinder, right? But you could perfectly imagine that, so here, say, is the point x, u of x. Okay, so you could perfectly imagine that if your surface is going through this point and the surface is sufficiently flat, okay, there's not much that I'm missing actually from the sphere to the cylinder. So let me make the following consideration. So uh, fix a number eta bigger than zero, and for uh, uh, scaling reasons and, and, and in order to fix ideas, let us assume that actually r is equal to one. Okay, and let me assume that the excess on the ball of radius one centered at x, u of x, which is going to be my point p, this is the excess of the graph of u. Um, okay, so that this one is less than some epsilon one, some constant. Okay, so now this is the excess with respect to a certain optimal plane pi. So let pi be such that you're optimizing. So let's call this E. Okay, and now without loss of generality, let us assume that you make a rotation and you actually put this plane pi to be just the horizontal plane. Okay, rotate and assume pi is actually the horizontal plane, pi zero. Okay, so now since you have in our discussions, we are having, so this is p. So since we are, since we are considering a Lipschitz function with constant, say, less or equal than two, right? So it's actually a very easy exercise to see that if I take the cylinder of radius one half, so let's say actually even that the point p just for the sake of argument is the origin. So if I take the cylinder of radius one half centered at zero, okay, then the graph over this cylinder of the function that I'm looking at is certainly contained inside the ball, right? So since I have a, a, a Lipschitz bound, it's just a matter of playing with the constant, it's not possible that the function sort of escapes towards the vertical part of the cylinder. Okay, so now I just want to understand what is the maximal radius rho of a cylinder for which the graph of the function over this cylinder is still contained inside my, uh, 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 my, my ball, okay? So here I define rho to be the maximum among all sigma such that if I take C sigma of X and intersect it, uh, okay, so if I take the graph of U over the ball of radius rho, uh, of the ball of radius sigma centered at zero, so because I'm actually uh, assuming now that X is equal to zero, this is still contained inside the ball of radius one centered at zero. Okay, and I can actually make, first of all, the following observation. So when I look at the distance between the tangent plane at some point Q, let's say it's the point Y, U of Y, and the horizontal plane, okay? So it's not difficult to imagine that the distance between these two planes is actually comparable to the modulus of the derivative of the function. Okay, so this is just a, a very simple geometric exercise. So this is controlled by a constant times the modulus of the u, and it controls 
from below a constant to the minus one times the modulus of the u. And here, of course, I'm using actually uh, crucially the fact that the Lipschitz constant of u is less or equal than two. So my constant is depending on this two. All right, if I take a Lipschitz constant to be very, very high and I have very steep gradients, then this inequality is not true anymore. Okay, but now once I know this inequality, what I can actually uh, uh, discover is that uh, in this B sigma, if I integrate over B sigma du squared, right, this is going to be less or equal than the excess. And since B sigma is actually contained inside my sphere, it's going to be less or equal than, than the excess on the whole sphere with a constant that I have to pay, right? So I have to pay a constant for two reasons, because I'm actually using this instead of the modulus of the u, and because I'm actually integrating over the graph instead of integrating over the base, okay? Actually, that, that makes things better, because when I'm integrating over the graph, I'm actually uh, integrating a, 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 an area factor which is bigger or equal than one. Okay, so here I can then have this uh, very simple inequality. And I know that this is less than epsilon one by my assumption. Okay, but then on the other hand, I also know that the derivative of u is less or equal than Um, an absolute constant because I have the Lipschitz constant over there. This is less or equal than two. I can actually interpolate and I can say that the L to M norm, for instance, in the ball of reduced sigma, right, is less or equal than a constant, and then I can interpolate between this L2 bound and the L infinity bound, and if I made the computation correctly, I get epsilon one to the power one over two M. Okay, so now why did I do this? Well, I did this because if I control the derivative of U in L to M, since my ball is actually M dimensional, I have Morris inequality, which tells me that I'm Hölder, and so it also tells me that I have an L infinity bound on, on, or I have a uniform bound on the function u, right? So the oscillation of the function u is then going to be bounded on the ball of reduced sigma is then going to be bounded by a constant 10 times epsilon one to the power one over two m. This is just more raised embedding. But then I am assuming that the origin is in the graph of the function, so this means actually that, so uh, um, the L infinity norm of U is in fact, it's in fact bounded by a constant times epsilon to the power one over two M. Okay, now notice the following. So if I'm taking the maximal radius rho over which I have this inclusion for very simple continuity reasons, it means that for this particular radius rho, my graph must be hitting the sphere of radius one, right? Otherwise, if it's not hitting the sphere of radius one, then I can just make rho slightly larger and that's not the maximum one. Okay, then by, by, by a very simple consideration, so here there's a point, say, z. So the point z as modulus of, of z equal to rho, Okay, and what actually happens is that this point is u of z, z in coordinates. So modulus of z squared plus modulus of u of z squared must be equal to one. And now you get a bound on your function rho, right? On, on, your, on your rho. So because you actually get that uh, one minus rho squared, which is less or equal than modulus of u of z squared. This is actually less or equal than a constant times epsilon one to the power one over m, okay? So this means actually rho has to be pretty close to one. In particular, if you remember, I fixed this eta, and what, do I want, what, what did I want to do with this eta? 
If eta is small, I can then choose epsilon 1, very small, said so that the cylinder of radius 1 minus eta centered at 0 intersected the graph is still contained in my ball. Okay? And then, of course, once again, now I can compare the excess in the cylinder with the excess on the ball. And so modulo choosing the excess very small, what is the philosophy of this? The philosophy of this is that whether I'm using the excess on the sphere or the excess on the cylinder, actually the two will be essentially comparable, right? So I just have to wiggle my radius a little bit. So now when I control, so when I have the integral over the cylinder, C1 minus eta intersected the graph of u of my usual whatever TP graph of u minus pi zero squared, I will be able to control this with the integral over the ball of radius one. And okay, so here I just have the same thing. Okay, so, so these are all kind of uh, uh, small lemmas which we will use at a certain point in both the proof of um, um, Angren's theorem and, and the Georgi's theorem. But so now let us actually come to the most important tool that we will use in both, uh, uh, um, in both uh, theorems. So, let us now, for the moment, fix ideas and say that you are on the cylinder of radius r centered at some point uh, 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 x. Okay, and assume that the normalized excess, so assume that one over two, uh, okay, so assume r to the power minus m times the cylindrical excess, which is the thing which scales correctly, so centered on CRX, assume that this is somehow very small, so small than some constant epsilon two. Okay, so, so you are in, in such a situation now, apply scaling and translation So scale the function back to radius one and the point x translated to zero, then you have the assumption that the excess of the graph u on the cylinder C10 compared to the horizontal plane pi zero, because when I'm actually leaving the, horizon, the plane way away, then that is horizontal, this is somehow very small. This is epsilon two. And then as we have observed, this means that the integral of a gradient of u squared is actually less or equal than epsilon two times a constant. So let us actually call this E, as we have done other times. So in fact, as an intermediate step here, I will have a constant times E, and then here I have a constant times epsilon two. Okay, so now let's look at the halde littlewood uh, maximal function of the derivative of U at some point Y. So let's say this is the supremum over r bigger than zero of the average of the u squared. It's actually the hardly readable multiple function of the u squared on the ball of radius r centered at y. And let me do the supremum over all radii between one half and zero. And let me assume actually that the point y is in the ball of radius one half centered at zero. Okay, so then you have the classical uh, weak L1 estimate for this maximal function. So you actually know that if I want to truncate 
So if I want to take as a following set, so say the set L, where the maximal function of the u squared uh, in y is less or equal than some, say, e to the power 2 alpha, right? So the hard deletable maximal uh, uh, theorem will tell me, or the, the, the weak L1 uh, estimate will tell me that the sides of the complement of, of, of k on the ball of radius 1 half. Wait, what is k? K is L. Uh, k is L, sorry, yes. The complement of L, then this is less or equal than the integral of the u squared. Here I have a constant, and then I have to divide by e to the power 2 alpha. Right, so here it gives me actually a constant times e to the power one minus two alpha. Okay, so I have an efficient Lipschitz approximation now because it's a classical exercise in Sobole space theorem, in Sobole, in Sobole space theory, to actually prove that if I restrict u to the, uh, um, to the set L, the Lipschitz constant of the restriction is actually e to the power alpha. Well, a constant times e to the power alpha. Okay, but so far I'm actually having this observation only for a Lipschitz function. This is always valid. It's actually valid for a general Sobolev function. Now I want to use the fact that the graph is area minimizing to actually improve the estimate on this L, in a sense. So in fact, I have a Lipschitz approximation theorem which tells you that I can, I mean, if you are area minimizing, this truncation with the maximal function is actually much more efficient as an approximation than for a general Lipschitz function. Okay, and this we will call, we will call uh, improved Lipschitz approximation. And let me give you the exact proposition in its uh, uh, all, I mean, in its, in its full generality, and then, I mean, here in the lecture notes, you can actually go through the proof in every details. It, it will be impossible to give you all the details of the proof, but I want to give you somehow the kind of core idea, the core estimate why this improvement is going to happen, okay? So here is the proposition. So the proposition is saying, so there are constant epsilon bar bigger than zero and gamma bigger than zero, so these are only dimensional constants such that the following holds. So take a function v, which is going from the ball of radius r centered at x into rn. So let this be a, a Lipschitz map. And assume the Lipschitz constant is less or equal than 2. OK. So assume the graph of u is area minimizing. And v. This area minimizing, and assume that this normalized excess, so this is going to be r to the power minus m, and then you have the excess of the graph of v on the cylinder of radius r centered at x is less than epsilon bar. Okay, so if we set Rho, okay, so here there are actually constant epsilon bar, gamma, and also constant C, bigger than zero. So if we set rho to be one minus uh, R times one minus a constant times this E to the power gamma, okay, I actually find a set K inside the ball of radius rho centered at X such that the following two estimates hold. 
So first of all, what the set K misses from the ball is actually a set of measure bounded by a constant times e to the power 1 plus gamma. Okay, and then the other thing is that the Lipschitz constant of V restricted to K is less or equal than E to the power gamma. Actually, I think in the, so let me see. I think actually in the claim of the proposition I'm, I'm doing without this constant. Okay, everywhere. I mean, you, you can easily imagine that if I have an estimate with a constant over here, everywhere, and if I just make my, with a certain power gamma, then I make my gamma slightly smaller, then I can actually eat up the constant with the uh, uh, epsilon bar over here. So I can eat up any constant with this epsilon bar to the power something by taking epsilon bar eventually smaller. Okay, so you see the difference between the approximation that we got here, where the Lipschitz constant is e to the power alpha, but the set that we are missing is e to the power one minus two alpha, and you can see here that instead we are getting a super linear estimate. So there the, the estimate is sublinear in terms of the excess. Here the estimate is actually super linear in terms of the excess. And the reason why we are able actually to do this is because the graph is area minimizing. So let me give you a sketch of a proof. So first of all, sorry. Yeah. Yo. Definitely. Yeah, otherwise it's pretty silly, right? Okay, so first of all, when you want actually to prove that theorem, we will apply this scaling and translating invariance and assume that x is equal to zero and r is equal to one, right? So we are then reduced to this situation that we were discussing before. Okay, and then let me not discuss how you actually eat up only a small fraction of, the, of your radius. You can easily imagine that if I can prove the estimate between, I mean, going from the radius r to the radius r divided by two, you can then adjust the technicalities so to actually get just a little bit in the inside, okay? So let me focus on how you actually improve your estimate going from r equal one to rho equal one half. Okay, so then it's a, just a technical fact that you can, in fact, eat up only a little bit of your initial radius r over here. Okay, so the point is actually the following. So the point is that when you are estimating this thing over here, right, the full estimate of the, of the weak L1 estimate, it's, I mean, the full power, it's, 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 um, it, it, it's, 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 ac it's actually giving you a domain of integration here, which is rather small. So in fact, the weak L1 estimate actually tells you the following, that if you're going, to, I mean, if you're looking at the points y in the ball of radius one half, where the maximal function of du squared is bigger or equal than some e to the power two omega, okay? This is actually less or equal This is actually less or equal then one over e to the power two omega, but here there's an integral which actually takes place of where the maximal function is bigger than one over a constant e to the power two omega. So you're actually not integrating over the whole domain, you're actually integrating over a subdomain where you know that the gradients are very high. And now the idea is that we actually try to estimate this quantity over here 
by making an energy comparison argument. So we try actually to get a much better estimate for this term. So before we used that this term is less or equal than the constant times E, and now we actually want to use that this term has a much better estimate. OK, so how am I going to do that? So the idea is that, first of all, I make my truncation. So I, may, I make my truncation, and I define a function w, which is a Lipschitz extension of v over l. OK, so this is the complement of l. So l is the set where the maximal function of the powers of the power two of the function is less or equal than e to the two omega. So we let w be a, say, e to the two, e to the omega Lipschitz extension. <coughs> of v restricted to l, where l is the set where the maximal function of du squared is less or equal than e to the two omega. OK, so now this V is not too far from, I mean, this W is not too far from V. And we will see in a moment that you can imagine that although W, I mean, W is not too far from V, what I would like to do is to use W as a competitor for the area minimizing property of the function V. OK? But of course, W and V don't agree everywhere. So if I fix some radius, and I want to stick in W instead of V inside this radius, I have to kind of patch the function W, which does not have the correct trace, to the function V. OK? So I will do this now in, 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 in a moment. I will tell you why this is possible. But imagine just for a second that actually it's W the minimizer and not V. So imagine. W is the minimizer. Now, why do I want to actually imagine that? Well, I want to imagine that because if W is the minimizer, since the Lipschitz constant of W is actually less or equal than e to the power omega, I can actually tailor expand my area functional and discover that the area, that the area of this graph is very similar to the Dirichlet energy of the function W. OK, so remember the formula, the volume of the graph of u, uh, of the graph of w, say, on the ball of radius 1 half. OK, so this one is the integral. And here you have the square root of 1 plus dw squared. And then you have higher order terms, I mean quartic terms, actually, in dw. OK, so now make a Taylor expansion of this, and you will have that this is equal to the volume of the, of the disk, because the Taylor expansion of square root of 1 plus 